I um, have the great and amazing pleasure of introducing someone I have admired um, since I was old enough to know who she was and what she did. Um, even as a, a young girl uh, aspiring to be a lawyer, um, I knew of Marion Wright Edelman and the amazing work that she was doing. Um, there is a saying and a greeting within the Maasai tribe of Africa where warriors actually will meet one another and they greet with the question, how are the children? And the response is an indication of how society is. You ask the question regardless of the person, whether that person has children or not, because it's an indication that the well-being of the children is an indication of the well-being of society as a whole. And so Mrs. Edelman is someone who really lived out that whole idea that it takes a village to raise a child. And our village is the entire country. This village is a worldwide village. And the most vulnerable, the most precious, the most important um, of those among us and with, with us are our children. I am not going to read through this very illustrious bio. Um, and she just gave me a thumbs up uh, because e everybody knows uh, Miss Settlement. Now, what I will say, you know, we're at, and I'm going to constantly say this, it means something really important to me to be at an event that is a prophetic gathering, a place where people of God have come to speak out against injustices. And our next speaker, I often, to be honest with you, Ms. Edelman, I always want to refer to you as Reverend. <laughs> um, Reverend Doctor, Reverend, you know, I mean, because she is one of the greatest prophetic voices in our country. And I've read, you know, her stories and I've read several, uh, several of her books. What I will say is that she, her voice at the time that she came along with the Children's Defense Fund was one of the greatest voices that the church had because she comes out of a faith tradition in what she does. She does this as a disciple of Jesus Christ. She does it as a, a preacher and a prophet. And so um, one of the other things she does, her church is a worldwide stage. So every summer, if any of you have not yet had a chance to attend, actually one of the greatest revivals ever, every year, also one of the hottest places on the planet, uh, <laughs> is at Haley Farm, the Children's Defense Fund this summer will have the 22nd annual Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Child Advocacy Ministry. Um, and again, it's called the Institute, but this is a revival, y'all. I mean, it is like preaching and singing. And I mean, I'm talking like the Spirit of God descending upon some people. And when you walk out of there, as we hope you will walk out of here at the end of this week, you have been changed. And you know that you have been on holy ground. So without further ado, um, I am not introducing to anyone, but presenting to all of us for this afternoon, um, the Reverend Marion Wright Edelman. <laughs> Well, I love that introduction since I am the granddaughter, paternal and maternal, of Baptist ministers, and the daughter of a Baptist minister, and the sister of a Baptist minister, and the aunt of a Baptist minister. Um, and I go to United Methodist churches and Baptist. I go to a whole lot of churches because I don't think God is denominational. Um, so that, um, but I'm just delighted to be here with you and. People often ask me why I do what I do. I do what I do because my parents did what they did and my community co-parents did what they did. 
And my daddy always said to us children that God runs a full employment economy <laughs> and that if you just follow the need, you will never lack for a meaningful and purposeful life. And he's never sent me wrong. And the issue is kind of how are we now going to sort of follow what needs to be done and what does God call us to do. And I'm just so delighted to be here with you. You brought this gorgeous weather. Thank you very much. Um, and um, never has been more important to have people of faith raise their voices, use their feet. But I just want to say very clearly that this is long, hard work. I thought that the Children's Defense Fund would have been out of work by now. I thought we would have just been able to close down if we told the country what is best, what is right, um, and what is cost effective, that we'd have the common sense and the moral sense to do what is right. But boy, a voteless, voiceless constituency has to have
And I often hear when we talk about what's going on in our communities, well, they're not church members. I say, well, what's that got to do with anything? Um, and so we need to get back some Bible study for church leaders and so that we can begin to talk about what would Jesus do if he were here. But we need to get out there. These children are living unthinkable lives, terrified by gangs, by drugs, by violence, and the church doors are not open most of the time as a place of haven. So I just hope we'll think about that. And I'll talk, to, somebody asked me about freedom schools in the Q&A period, because there ought to be freedom schools everywhere. Vacation Bible School could actually turn into freedom schools. And there's some good models in some places, but children are just desperate for caring adult attention. But let's go back to the need to eliminate child poverty. Um, in this country and that we know how to do it. We asked the Urban Institute to look at um, nine programs that we knew worked um, and were effective. They included things like housing vouchers and they came back um, and earned income tax credit and child tax credit, all the things that we know about and said, but if you invested in these things and in child care, how much poverty could we eliminate? Um, and they came back and said that we could eliminate or decrease child poverty immediately by about 62%. Black child poverty or in children in non-white um, um, communities and families, 72%. And that we could lift the whole floor of, 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 of children in poverty and in an extreme poverty um, for 97% of our children, all for $77 billion a year. How much less is that than Mr. B what Mr. Boehner thought was a drop in the bucket of our federal budget? We have 15.5 million children who are poor in the world's second largest economy, depending on how you want to count it. That number of children exceeds the population of 11 United States states. I don't know how many of you are here from Alaska and Hawaii and Idaho and Maine and Montana and New Hampshire, North Dakota, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Vermont, and Wyoming but it is greater than combined populations of all of these states. It's greater than the population combined of Sweden and Costa Rica. Our 6.8 million extremely poor children, that's half the poverty level, exceeds the populations of Alaska, Delaware, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Vermont, and Wyoming, and is greater than the population of Denmark and Finland. I don't know how we could stand it, and I don't think God wants us to stand it. And the younger children are, the poorer they are. During their years of greatest brain development, every other baby that this country is going to depend on for its future viability and competitiveness is non-white. And two in five black babies is poor, 150 years after slavery was legally abolished. America's poor children did not ask to be born. They did not choose their parents, their country, their state, their neighborhood, their race, color, or faith. In fact, if they had been born in 29 other Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, what we call OECD countries, they would be less likely to be poor. Among these 34 countries, America ranks 30th in relative child poverty ahead only of Israel and Mexico, Spain, and Greece, although we have, again, the second largest economy in the world. England, or the United Kingdom, whose economy, if it were an American state, I still find it hard to actually believe this. I've gone back to say, are you sure this is true? But they keep telling me it is. Would rank just above Mississippi in wealth, national wealth, but they committed to and succeeded in cutting their child poverty rate by half in 10 years. And it really is about values and political will. And sadly, in our country, politics, they say it's good politics, but I think it's bad politics, trumps good policy and moral decency and responsibility uh, to the next generation and to our nation's future. So it's well past time when we all get our act together and say enough and come here like you have come and knock on those doors. And I tell you, you got to be a good pest. And I'll come back to Sojourn the Truth, whom I can't seem to get through a speech without talking about. And I've got a good friend who's a Republican conservative whom I will not name and whom I could always have access to. Now I have to stand out of the bath, outside his bath when I you know, wait, find out when he's going to the bathroom. 
and to try to grab him, but we've got to become better pests for justice and for God's work. And we can't just let people um, get off the hook or continue to try to be polite. This is about children's lives. This is about children's hopes. This is about children's education. This is about children's hunger. And I hope you'll look at this week's HuffPost piece because we're really concerned about what's going to happen this summer and the extraordinary increase in child summer hunger. Um, I get reports from my state offices, particularly Mississippi, on Mondays often, and I just I can't stand it. If the bus driver is late and they miss their, their breakfast, you know, they cry because they have not had adequate food over the weekend. And it's really just outrageous, and they've learned to stand in line and figure out which kids don't eat certain things and certain things, and they stand there and then wait and ask permission if they could finish their breakfast. But this is just, this is, uh, this, we have 100% federal funding, 100% federal funding for summer feeding programs for children. And just like Medicaid, states won't take it. It's jobs for bus drivers, it's jobs for cafeteria workers, it's jobs. We build it into our freedom schools. What kind of people turn down health care by the tens of billions in jobs? What kind of people won't feed children for three long months? So look at it and see what your church can do and what your community is doing and call those hotlines and see how you can do something to stop this hunger during the summer. Children are not looking forward to the summer if they're poor and without food. Every housing project. Churches with restaurants should be out there, but please look at that column. But we do not have, we should not have hungry children in America. But I'd love to have you look at our website, look at this ending child poverty thing, and let's talk about what we are going to do to make this a big part of not only the election campaign, nobody should get our vote that doesn't make a commitment to children, to end child poverty. Um, but and to break up the cradle to prison pipeline, which I'm going to talk about very briefly. Um, but every year, we law, you know, people say we can't afford it. We can't afford not to do it. Every year, when we did, we've been crying in the wilderness since oh, since our beginning. But in 1994, we asked Nobel laureate economist M at MIT, Bob Solo, to look at the cost of child poverty, and he concluded that every year we let. 15 million children go up in poverty, cost our nation about a half trillion dollars or $500 billion um, in foregone productivity. Um, and the bottom line is that we can't afford not to eliminate child poverty. So if you took the $77 billion we're proposing to do 62% and, and more of the, of the minority children, um, what in the world is the matter with us? And our states are spending, on average, three times more per prisoner than for public school pupil. That's about the dumbest investment policy we could have. And so the issue is not about, is there enough money? Of course there's enough money. But there's not enough voice. There's not enough worrying them to death. And so we've got to begin to reverse priorities. Um, people say, well, how are you going to find all this money? But what Bob Solo said a long time ago in the first report is that for many years, Americans have allowed child poverty levels to remain astonishingly high, far higher than one would think a rich and ethical society would tolerate. The justification when one has offered one at all has often been that action is expensive and that we have more will than wallet. I suspect that in fact our wallets exceed our will. But in any event, this concern for the drain on our resources completely misses the other side of the equation. Inaction has its cost too. And as an economist, I believe that good things are worth paying for. And that even if caring and curing children's poverty were expensive, it would be hard to think of a better use in the world for money. If society cares about children, it should be willing to spend money on them. And we had Mr. Bernanke came and talked to one of our conferences within the last few years, and he said that the most cost-effective investment one could make is on early childhood development, and you and I are going to put a quality early childhood system in place in this nation over the next four years. And that should be one of our first demands. If we could all get ourselves together and do one big thing a year that over the next five to six years adds up to a, a support system for the whole child, we can get it to happen. And so I just hope that we will be clear about our agenda, do our homework, and then raise our voice. 
We lay out in this child poverty report how we could pay for some of these things. Um, we say we could get the $90 billion just from closing tax loopholes from all these corporations that have moved abroad um, and to, to, to deny paying federal taxes. We could eliminate the capital gains tax. How many decades have we been talking about eliminating capital gains taxes? Um, and really, that would raise us $84 billion a year that we could invest in working people and in children. We lay out a range of tax loopholes that the Ways and Means Committee in the House has been protecting. And I hate that F-35 bomber. F-35 fighter jet program, which is already several years behind schedule, 69%, 68% over budget, and is still not producing a fully functional plane. Now, our early childhood data is a whole lot stronger. We know that works, <laughs> and we know it's going to produce productive adults that will be able to work for us. And for the nearly $400 billion in projected cost of this program, we could reduce child poverty by 60% for five years. So I just think, again, we should do our homework. We lay it out on a lot of things and then say, we don't have a money problem. We have a priority problem. We have a morality problem. And we should just be clear. And so we can lay this all out. They wanted an increase in the military budget. Um, the, the, the folk in the Hill and screaming about putting in a little bit of money in foster care. Um, for Foster Care Commission, this made me really mad. They, um, we were just trying to get a few, uh, 10 million, I don't know what it was, really less than $10 million a year to do something for foster care children, I think it was to provide transportation for them to get to school. Um, and they said we didn't have a pay go um, for it and you can't do that. At the same time, they voted to do this estate tax in the House um, without a pay go for the richest top 1%. Um, it is, the hypocrisy is enormous, but I think what it is is the gap in our voice, and we just need to begin to call them to account. My last school desegregation case in Mississippi, and I'm going to move quickly in the, into the Cradle of Pison Pipeline, was with a great woman named Ms. May Bertha Carter and her sharecropper husband, Matthew. And they had 13 children. And they did not want their last eight children to be a sharecropper. And we had been in school, had a number of school desegregation cases, but she came to me and she says, I want to exercise, sue, I want you to sue for me and exercise my freedom of choice to go to school in Drew, son, have my children go to that white school over in Drew, Sunflower County, Mississippi. She and Ms. Hamer were very good friends. And um, I said, Yes, ma'am, Miss Sam Carter, but I said, you know what that's going to mean? She said, I don't care what it means, because if your children don't have a decent education, they don't have a decent future. We sued for Miss Carter and for her husband, Matthew, sharecroppers. Um, they got kicked off their plantations. They got shot at. I loved Miss Carter, because she said every morning, she told those children she would give them a little sermon about how they must never hate white people. But she would talk about how she would pray the school board when the school bus come down the road. She would pray that school bus back to school, pray the children through school all day, stand on the porch and pray them home. <laughs> but the bottom line, she prayed them through every one of those last eight children graduated from the Drew Municipal Public Schools, which is now in receivership. Um, and they stuck. And they all graduated from high school in the formerly white school. I cannot describe for you how hard that was, the harassment that went on, the dangers that went on. And they ended up, after getting sh shot in the, their homes, they, they moved. But then Head Start came along, and we were able to create independent jobs so people had a way to live and to eat. But they went through hell to get those children an education. They graduated, every one of them. They were the one white black child in every class. And then they went on to Ole Miss and Mississippi State. They all graduated from college. And they all became professionals. And um, her first, the first group of children did not. They had gone to the segregated schools. But then about 10 years ago, I got a call from a good mutual friend who wrote a wonderful book about Ms. Carter, which I would recommend to you. It's called Silver Rights. She never could pronounce civil rights correctly. She <laughs> called them silver rights. She should have said gold rights, but silver rights. Um, and she said, you got to help. I said, what's the problem? She said, Ms. Carter's grandson, Matthew, and Ms. Carter's grandson is in parchment prison. And I said, not Ms. Carter, 
grandson, not after all of that sacrifice, all of that harassment, all of that trouble to get him an education, and this is just one generation off, and indeed he was, and that's how we began to learn about the Cradler Prison Pipeline. The Mississippi prison system is just teeming with young black men, um, and older black men, many in there for nonviolent drug offenses, um, usually marijuana, the average literacy level in all uh, um, Mississippi prisons um, is fifth grade. They can't read, and if you've got a conviction for marijuana possession, you have no way of getting a job other than trying to sell drugs again, and then you're back in prison, and private prisons are just making incredible amounts of money um, at the expense of these young folk, and that's how we began to understand about this cradle prison pipeline. We began to do our homework, and you know, it's lodged at the intersection of race, and history, um, and poverty. Um, it's about hopelessness. Um, black children um, are disproportionately at risk of going to prison. Um, white Latino children are disproportionate non of going to prison. Um, but it is the mass incarceration system is, as now we are becoming more aware of, um, a massive blight on our nation. And we have got to break it up. But the most dangerous place in America for a child to try to grow up and survive is at that intersection of race and poverty. And I hope you will look at the figures that we put up on our website and we did a report on the Cradle of Prison Pipeline, oh, I don't know, over 12 years ago, and I think we better update it now, with John Hope Franklin and Dorothy Hyde and our black network saying we've got to break this up. Um, and um, and it's, I'm glad to see it becoming um, um, a, a major public issue, but it is morally obscene and it is sending our young people off and away from the futures that they deserve in this country. And we laid out an agenda, and our mission, I think, is always our agenda, because children don't come in pieces. And we have been trying to make good policy like good parenting. There is no parent who's going to say, I want my child to be born without good prenatal care, or not to have a good, strong, quality early childhood system or to leave their children at home without that, um, and to get their children ready for school, and then to make sure that there are schools that are ready for children, and are fair to children, um, and to have them safe after school, and people have to work. And so our mission of a healthy start, a head start, a fair start, a safe start, a moral start in life, and successful transition to adulthood is what every parent, caring parent, wants for their children. And some of us can't afford to do that, and that is what our mission is. And when you look at what is required to break up this cradle to prison pipeline, it is everything that we want for our own children. And we have not, we've tried to stay disciplined in saying we've got to have, and we've made great progress, a high quality health care system. We've made great strides in getting health care thanks to the voice of many of you, um, even though they tried to throw Chip out of, of the um, Affordable Care Act and said, you know, got it, no chance got to have a, a broader health system. We got it back in by having a baby stroller parade with about 4,000 people around the Capitol. They, could, they found that they could put it in for another four years, and then we got it in for another two years, and then for another two years. Um, and we said you can't put children into these state exchanges until you can prove that they are equal um, in benefits and in costs to what they could get under CHIP and under Medicaid, which just took us years, age by age, to get. But it's, get them born healthy. Get them born without birth defects. Get them born with, with adequate nutrition. Get them born with mothers who've had prenatal care. And you know, and we're, we're, we've gone a long way toward that. Then let's put into place that zero to four, the early to zero to five early childhood system that is of high quality. And we've got the building blocks in place. And if we just decided that we we're gonna work on one big children's step forward a year, and since we've now been able to get med Head Start up to a large amount of money and get preschool education invested in in a number of states, you know, we can put all these things together and have a high quality system and we've all drafted the policies, we know what to do. And I would just hope that we could um, really say that everybody, because the research evidence is so clear, the cost effect is so clear, is that within the first year, I don't care who gets elected that we're gonna get this investment in place. The president's put in a large proposal. Hillary's gonna put in a large proposal. Bernie Sanders has put in a proposal in the past on early childhood. Let's get the building block 
in place with a high quality, comprehensive system with high parent engagement and quality, quality, quality. But that's the second piece. We've got to get them ready for school. Third, I'm for accountability in schools, but you don't, can't hold children accountable for common core standards um, by kindergarten when majority of states don't have full day kindergarten in place. I'm sick of children being told that they've got to meet standards that we don't give them the means to succeed in meeting. So one of, we fight a lot because we've got to break down the silos of our providers. You know, the preschool people think they should have all the money. The zero to three people think they all have the money. We all need to look at the child. And I always try to keep the child in the middle of the table. And if we providers and we adults get our act together, we can move the policy along. But getting every child full day kindergarten that is of high quality so they're ready for first grade. Then we gotta make all of our schools ready for all of our children. And I'll tell you, it is a disgrace because they are not, and I'm gonna come back to that. We need to have a strong, high quality aftercare system in the afternoons because summer learning loss is a big thing and parents are trying to work. And that's in the summer, we've gotta do something and I would hope everybody would look at our Freedom School program. And we are working very hard in our Freedom School program. We'll have about 200 this summer. Um, and they ought to be in every church. They ought to be in every congregation. Um, but we are using, college students as the teacher servant leaders. Um, and a majority of those are, um, well, about 90% are non-white, but I love it that about a third in one year we had a half were non, were, were, were black and Latino males. I want these children to go to schools where the only person of color is not the janitor and the cook. They need to see what they can become. And we're trying to put as many of these um, freedom schools on college campuses and on college um, so that they can get something called college and not prison in their minds. And we can begin by infusing our young college students with a new pedagogy, um, which is about children. Um, and no, who says reading can't be fun? We have fun in Freedom School. And we sing, and we don't, and, I'm, and they work everywhere. We have them in, in, in homeless shelters. We have them in secure detention facilities. And I remember when we got our first secure detention people after it took, took a long time, and they said, well, you know, they, you don't understand these gangs. They're rival Latino black gangs. They'll tear up at this place if you start talking about, you know, not having discipline and all of this. Um, and besides, after they got pushed by their county board of supervisor chair, who happened to be very strong supporter of Freedom School, they said, you're gonna have to keep, you're gonna have to take our teachers. And I said, well, they're gonna have to come to Haley Farm for training, and you're gonna have to take our college students. And then it turned out that the probation guards also came for training. And you know what happened after the first summer? They, fights went down 97%. Suspensions went down. They forgot that they were guards. I mean, they, it, our image of the children, it just, it's, it's just amazing. Um, and my favorite story is, 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 is the Catholic groups um, put together a freedom school and secure detention facility in Houston. And um, they were suspicious too, but they kept it. And the little boy um, in this first summer had been um, in the Freedom School, but he got out a week after the Freedom School started, but he came back the next Monday and said, I ain't leaving until that fun school is over. <laughs> Children just need fun and role modeling and, and high expectations. So look at some of the Freedom School videos and our things. See how you can open one in your church and in your own area. And the Methodist bishops, some of them have been very wonderful in getting them into the secure detention facilities throughout um, Ohio. Children will live up or down to our expectations. They just need adults who care, who see them, who respect them, and who are gonna be there for them. And so we are very excited about this model. Jobs, they need to have hope. They need to have schools at work, and we need to hold our schools accountable. And so I hope you will look at um, the things that we have on our website about how we can break up this cradle prison pipeline, but it is all the same things we want for our own children. We've been working for it piece by piece, and then we've got to connect them and have a continuum of high quality care, and then we've got to pay very special attention to those children who really have been left behind because of foster care because of the juvenile justice system, because they've got to go someplace too. But they're all God's children, and they're all sacred, and we're gonna all have to share streets with them. Let me just end very quickly by saying, I didn't know I'd gone on so long. I, my, my sister, we all share everything, and I got this clipping, uh, so my staff is tired of hearing about it. One day that arrived, came in the mail, um, saying everything you need to learn in life, you can learn from Noah's Ark. And um, the first lesson from Noah's Ark was don't miss the boat. 
And the United States is going to miss the boat to the future. And they're going to miss the boat for God's blessings, I believe, if we don't invest in our children. The greatest national economic and military security problem in this country is not from any outside enemy. It is from our failure to prepare our next generations to be the leaders in this country. You cannot have A majority of all of our children all races cannot read a computer at grade level in fourth or eighth grade. That's all of our children of all colors. But almost 80% and over 80% of black children cannot read or compute at grade level in fourth and eighth grade. And we all know what the dropout rates got to do. What? 74% of our 24, 18 and 24 year olds can't get in the military because of literacy level, because of prior incarceration, because of health problems. Um, who's going to be? Suspending the country, who's going to lead the country and compete with the Chinese and all the rest? Um, our enemy is within, our enemy is us, our enemy is our neglect of our children. So we're going to miss the boat to the future unless we really pay attention to these little children. Secondly, we're all in the same boat. And we know a lot of people are absolutely crazy because we've got a non white president, a black president in the White House, and because of changing demographics. And we may not love all these children, but they are going to be determining America's future. And we better invest in them now and have them educated and working for us in the social security system and Medicare system and a strong military. We're going to continue to be militaristic. Um, but we're all in the same boat. And as you know, God did not make two classes of children. And I think he's going to hold us accountable for all of them. The third is to sort of plan ahead because it was not raining when Noah built the ark. And I'm sure everybody thought he was crazy. Um, but, you know, with this quick fix um, first quarter profits session, we're missing the long-term needs that is going to make us get to be a really great nation. And the importance of not listening to our critics, we're also so timid. Jesus wasn't timid. Jesus was a radical. Um, and he tried to live his faith. And if you don't want to be criticized, don't do anything and don't be anything, but don't really call yourself a Christian. You've got to stand <laughs> out there and, and do what is right. And the last one before I shut up so we can have your questions because I've gone on too long is to remember that the ark was built by amateurs and the Titanic by experts. <laughs> we keep looking for some magical political leader to come and solve all of our problems. So for somebody, you're looking for that great demagogue to come in and make it all right. Um, Dr. King, and a lot of people looking for Dr. King to come back, or the next Dr. King to come back. Dr. King didn't start a single movement on his own. It was Miss Parks and E.B. Nixon and all these local people who got mad. It was the kids, and a whole lot of folks sat down for Miss Parks. And Joanne Robinson found Dr. King and made him the head of the Montgomery <laughs> movement because he was the newest guy in town and didn't have a lot of baggage. It was people. Things have to, you know, you had to have Fred Shuttlesworth in Birmingham. You had to, I mean, September Clark out there in the citizenship school. It, it, this is a movement that comes from the bottom and not from the top and not from a single leader. But Dr. King had a great gift in being able to encapsulate our dreams and our hopes. And I think that we should stop waiting around to see who's going to come and rescue us again. We are it. And if the people of God can't come together with all of our millions and stand up for poor children when we say we worship a God who came into the world as a poor baby, then we have only ourselves to blame. So I just thank you for being here. We can change this nation. We have got to change this nation. And we can do it if you do it. I tell full journalists I end, and we don't need to be big dogs. Everybody wants to be a big dog and make a big difference. But I quote Sojourner. I wear these two out on my neck every year. And you may have heard me say this before. But when I think I'm having a bad day, I think about their days, Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth. Both illiterate slave women who could not read or write, but they could know what the Bible said. Sojourner could remember everything in the Bible. And then, you know, we began to sort of, but, but she, and she spoke out about um, how she could make a difference, and she got heckled one day by an old white man, Sojourner did, and said, old lady, I don't care anymore no about your anti-slavery talk for an old flea bite. And she said, that's all right, Lord willing, I'm going to keep you scratching. <laughs> we should each think of ourselves as strategic fleas. Enough fleas biting in your different congregation and your communities can move the biggest dog. And so I just hope that rather than trying to be big people, 
let's be little fleas and let's work together and build that movement our children need. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for speaking. You always inspire us. Um, you talked about different ideas. Back in 96, in Atlanta, Georgia, um, the Friendship Baptist Church down there used to do, the big thing was immunization. And so we used to go knocking on doors, knocking, knocking, and of course, those who were illegal, um, here illegally, didn't want to get their children vaccinated. That was in 96. We still have that problem today. We still have that problem. I'm sorry, you got you Yes, we still have that problem today. And then the other part was just trying to make sure that um, our children don't give up. They won't give up if we don't give up. They do what their adults do. Um, we don't have a child problem, we have an adult problem. And so if we are out there, they're gonna go in and pick a lot of them and you're sort of standing up for them. We still have problems trying to get undocumented and immigrant children covered, but we have made enormous progress. And we've just had big strides forward, both in California and paying for undocumented, for all children in California to be able to get health care. And the same thing in New York State, and we are working on that very systematically with all the immigrant groups. So look at next week's Health Post <laughs> column. But no, we, a child is a child is a child. Amen. Okay, and they're all here. And, and the voice of these dream young people and others and the tearing apart of families and what is happening to children who are being sent, it's just heartbreaking. I, Bishop Kakano has been very moving, and she's been down at Haley. And the description that we have a staff down in McAllen on the, on, on, and in California and Texas, but on McAllen on the border. And you know they must be desperate, these parents who send really young children with even younger children. And we're just treating them, I mean, I just, I, I, the, the cup, the, those orange jumpsuits that prisoners wear are the same jumpsuits that people who are immigrants are coming are being detained by Homeland Security. What is the matter with us? I mean, I just say, but, but we're making progress on it. We've got a, a, and we are working now with UNICEF on the children who are coming into the country to make sure that they're getting the services and the immunizations. We had a massive immunization campaign a long time after Stanford Children, and we have now got coverage. 90% of all children now have access to health care. Getting them there and making it accessible to them is very important. But one of the things that taught us a lot, and we did a massive campaign in New York City with subways and buses, and we called it immunization, and people backlash because they, they, they confused immunization with immigration. Mm -hmm. So we changed it to vaccination. We are still, you know, we are all, we're a nation of immigrants, and, but, but you know, we're gonna have to come to grips with all this. We are making real progress, but we gotta finish the job. It's safer than the expanded healthcare. What kind of folk turned down tens of billions of dollars for these people to get jobs and to get health care? You know, that ought to have revoked a political revolution in itself, and we must not. And one of the things we have tried to build into policy, but because the Affordable Care Act was so wrought with so many political interests, and we've been expanding Medicaid state by state, and CHIP state by state, just putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, but, you know, we have tried to build into all of our federal policy initiatives from what we learned in Mississippi. When the state turned down Head Start, there was a provision in the act that private groups and church groups could come in and apply for the money. And that caused the political revolution. And they tried to kill the whole poverty program after that. And we try to build into everything that if the states will not enforce um, or take advantage of federal money, then other groups can put together coalitions, the counties, the cities can come in. And because of the, it was such a complicated thing to get the Affordable Care Act through, that went through without it, and they were making all kinds of bargains. But we've got to be very careful as we go forward. But I just hope that, as you know, they're trying to now give the states a second chance to get Medicaid um, without asking them to, to pay anything. 
Um, but we've got to have a, we have to have a voice. We have to have a political revolution, frankly, um, and throw people out who don't have the best interests. And let me just say one thing. This country, talk about, only the truth is going to make us free. Yeah. Only the truth is going to make us free. And this country is still struggling to come to grips with our birth defects of slavery, yeah. of Native American genocide, of the exclusion of all women from the electoral process, of the exclusion of all non-white, of all men, of all, not, not all poor men, non-profited men of all colors. They sold poor white men their skin in exchange for robbing them of their power. And we wow. keep seeing these birth defects flare up every half century. And the demographics and the presidents has just brought all this out. We, it's time to deal with it, and, and we've got to deal with that history and confront that history, and I think that we're in one of those periods now where this is, it's got to, it, we've got to come to grips with it, because the attempts to move it all backwards, the attempts to really reinstitute it, and I bless Reverend Barber, because this, we've got to, we, we, we're either going to go backwards, and I don't want my children and your children and grandchildren to have to fight these battles all over again. And we've got to keep moving forward. And this is time for another third reconstruction era. We've got to get it together and do whatever we have to do nonviolently. I am really pleased with what, you, what Black Lives is, but that's not yet a movement. I want to make sure that it's got some goals, that it's got some discipline, that it's going to be nonviolent, that it's going to be sustainable, bless them. But I don't want another Occupy Wall Street. I mean, we need to keep it going. And People of God need to be there, and we all need to have a short-term, medium-term, long-term strategy. But this is time for new movement that is led by people with moral fiber and fiber and discipline and staying power. But this is, this is movement time, because we're either going to go backwards or going to go forward. We've got to go forward. Yes. Hi, and thank you so much. My name's Gimbia, and I actually just want to ask you a question as a mom for a minute. I'm a mom of a preschooler. She'll start next year. And I live here in D.C. at that like horrible intersection of gentrification, race, and class. And we're lucky in D.C. We have universal pre-K-3. But I, I volunteer in my local school. You know, it's a school that we're, we are supposed to go to. And I see black teachers and black adults yelling at black kids. I see them treating the white kids that come from that side of town better than, that side of the school rather, better than they treat kids that come from the other side of the school. And how do I as a mom engage in that? How do you, what do you say to those of us that are like, we're the families that are walking in it? I am very blunt about <laughs> teachers of whatever color. You, you cannot fool a child. If you don't respect children or love children or have high expect children, expectations for those children, they know it. And, you know, so I, am, I'm, I, I say, listen, I'm trying to get everybody to stay out of law school and everybody to go into education because that is the battleground of, of, of the future. And I'm so happy I kept all three of my, law, my boys out of law school and they're all doing education in one way or another um, and they're dealing with... But, and I've been telling the teachers unions and everybody who's in the teaching classroom, if you don't love children, you get out because you're hurting children. It is not about, and we should be very, and teachers, and I mean, they need to go out and get to know these children in the neighborhoods. I don't know how these children are doing as well as they are, um, but we need to have teacher child watches. They need to go out and see where these children live, see what they're living with, and see how they can become a part of the solution and the healing of these children, and to have high expectations for all these children. Do not stand silent when children are being denigrated or discouraged. They have so much discouragement in their lives in so many ways. They don't need to come to school and get it. So we should get bad teachers out, and we should be getting more of our young folk in. And I am so happy that a lot of our freedom school people are changing their majors, including the black and Latino males, and they're going into teaching. Amen. God bless them. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to have a majority, we have a majority non-white school population, and they're wonderful teachers of all colors. But I don't want teachers being imported from India and Pakistan to teach in Mississippi's districts that are in receivership. 
we have got to create a new generation of teachers, and I'm also watching, we're trying to pull some of these retired teachers out of retirement and get them back in there to try to lift up some of these children in these districts in receivership. So we've got to recapture our children. They have so much hurt in their lives. I mean, just imagine the toxic stress. I love going up to Harvard. And they said, we just figured out why these inner city children, particularly all the young ones, are, are, are so thing. It's called toxic stress. I said, y'all just figure that out at Harvard. These children live with gun violence every day. <laughs> they live with poor housing and rats. But if Harvard says it, maybe we're really now making another step forward. <laughs> they have got to have caring adults in their lives, and we should not tolerate any teachers or any foster care people or any people dealing with children who are not respectful and reinforcing of them. So speak up, organize, get parent voices, talk to them quiet or the teachers, but just don't, don't tolerate it. The children just are so vulnerable and I just, um, they, they have nowhere to turn, which is why they love the Freedom School kids. They hang on to their, 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 their put you on the black bear, they're hanging on to their legs, they just, they, and, and they, it's hard to be what you can't see. And so we've made emphasis on two things. Um, we picked wonderful books and we we're trying to make sure that the fact that 90% of all books now are not written for, for children of color, but for white kids. But white kids need to read these books as much as black kids. Yeah. We, we, so we're spending a lot of time on picking really good books that instill the truth, but also give children hope little girl down after Katrina said, these books, we love our books. They get to take one home every week, but they say, we love our books because they, we, they, 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 we see people who look like us and they give us hope. They need hope. And they need to know that there's somebody out there who sees them. So I thank you for your perception and I just hope that you all will just begin to have a little parent support group um, to kind of just gather with the teachers, and then if the teachers are not responsive, um, then y'all should go on up to the next level, but we cannot have children coming to school with all their burdens with teachers who don't respect them and love them. Yeah. Love is what's key, and hope is what's key. the anniversary of Roots. And we bought Alex Haley's farm 24 years ago. And many of you have heard of Highlander Folk School, which was where Ms. Ha Ms. Ms. Park didn't just happen. And you know, in September Clark wrote the best citizenship manual, which I'm trying to update now, um, to get people empowered to do things. And we know, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt and Dr. King and all of them, they call it a communist citizenship school. Um, but we bought Alex Haley, that was the, but that was the last movement. And we bought Alex Haley's place down in Tennessee as our place of building the next generation of servant leaders. And tens of thousands of people have come through. And we do a couple of things every year. We will have 2,000 young people who prepare to work for Speedham Schools this summer. Um, but then we do the annual Samuel DeMitt Proctor Child Advocacy Minister Institute. Sam was our first preaching residence. And he also started a pickup resurrection choir. Um, and, and whatever the Lord blows in, but I tell you, I put that resurrection choir up against most choirs I hear in church on Sunday morning. It's really wonderful. And we have two of the most gifted male musicians who, who get along with each other. Uh, <laughs> uh, the most non-neurotic people who love the music is, is sublime. Um, and we have an organist on, a, on, a, on, on an organ that can... When they play Amazing Grace, they bring them back to Africa, and you can hear the slave cries and the waves. We have church down there, but we also, we're now bringing in more and more, we have the greatest preachers in the world. We've had the best of the, of the Lyman Beach lectures, and our co-pastors and residents took them two to replace Sam, but they're brilliant, is Otis Moss the Jr., who prayed me to school, to jail, all of us went to jail in Atlanta together, and Otis Moss the Third, and what we call our Moses, Miriam, Joshua, Deborah tracks. But we also make sure and 500 folk can fit into the Myelin Ark Chapel. It's, we have the only two Myelin design buildings in, in, that exist. Um, and more and more divinity schools are sending their professors and their students for credit. And so it's really a very exciting, intense week, but we also make sure that almost half 
of all the participants are children out of the juvenile justice system, out of the foster care system, so they can tell the church what they're not doing. And it's rich and it's wonderful. So you should, again, we've got stuff we're going to hand out here. You don't want to miss it. Um, but that's where our movement is being built, and um, I hope you will come and share in it and build it and take it back home. Thank you so much.